Okay, Liam, welcome to the Profit Podcast. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing great, Matt. Thank you. How are you? Yes, I'm very good, thank you. And it's great for you and I to have a catch up. I know it's been a while. So it has indeed been a while. It's been a long used time. To, uh, used to see my ugly mug every day, but now yeah. not so much. <laughs> it's funny. I do think about that quite often in terms of the the crew that we had that I'd see on a, a very regular basis, and now we all sort of separated and gone off on these different adventures and ways. Yeah, it's nice to keep uh, keep in contact though, and keep these little uh, little connections and networks going, and seeing what everyone's up to, which is why we've brought you on today because you've got quite an interesting sort of uh i suppose series of like experiences and yeah. sort of different ways you've been involved in fitness and wrestling and i think it's a great story to talk about and some great teachings along the way and stuff as well so for the listeners that don't know who you are can you just give us a sort of a brief history of uh, liam slater and what you've been up to and, and how you found yourself in the fitness industry and in wrestling and all that good stuff yeah, of course. Um, so for, for me, my fitness journey really revolves around pro wrestling. Uh, for people that don't know pro, I mean, most people will do pro wrestling is basically WWE. Um, so it is a an artistic expression of a combat sport is the way that I like to phrase it. Um, but I've, I've always loved it as a kid. Then when I was 17, just going 18, I decided to give it a go. There was a place in Wakefield that was doing it. So I um, I got in contact with them uh, and I got started there. That set me on a, a, a journey of being a pro wrestler um, up to the point where I needed to make a decision about how I was going to make an income. Um, I then got interested in the gym through wrestling and having to look like a wrestler. Um, but I found it really interesting. I also found that I was enjoying helping people at training, which then led me down the path of personal training. Um, from there, I was doing both hand in hand uh, up to a point where I went, right, I need to make a decision here. I went into personal training full time uh, and then spent, I think it was about three and a half years, if I remember right, in terms of being a total fitness and working with profit. Um, then the world shut down. Um, that pretty much changed everything and again through a sort of series of events of me getting back in touch with people and people putting me forward for stuff I ended up going back into wrestling and then that led on to where I am now which is working full-time at Pursuit Pro Wrestling as a pro wrestling coach which is uh, you know not a not a job title we get on here very often so it's always nice to have a completely uh, completely different set of eyes um, and, and set of experiences. So what, just for, for people that are wondering, because I know that many listeners will be, what what does that entail? Like, what are you now doing in terms of, you know, are you, are you, are you training the wrestlers? How much of that is like gym-based or mat-based or what does that look like as a pro wrestling coach? Um, so the majority of my time, I run one, two, three, four sessions through the week is like full main sessions as I, I tend to brand them. Uh, and then I've got a cardio and conditioning class that I run fortnightly, um, plus some of classes. Basically, I teach people how to wrestle. So if people want to become a wrestler, um, they get in contact with us. I do a beginner's course that teaches them fundamentals, um, to which then I teach them how to create the art of professional wrestling. The majority, 90 Five, probably 99% of it is ring-based activities. How do we fall? How do we roll? Um, how do we do moves? How do we tell a story? Those sort of things and questions. Um, there is a portion of it, though. We, we're lucky in the facility that we have. We have pretty much a, a zone gym area. We've got a good set of dumbbells. We've got a wall rack that I made sure that we had installed um we've got like some back machines kettlebells like we've got a really decent amount of stuff so as a warm-up i'll usually take people through a a gym style circuit of either 30 seconds on 30 seconds off or 20 seconds uh, 40 seconds on 20 seconds off just to get them moving and flowing so there is some element of gym training that comes in with it but the majority of my time is spent um answering the question of how do i become a pro wrestler yeah yeah cool and in terms of Having been a PT in that interim period, and I know that some of that time was spent sort of working on your own. And then, like you mentioned, you you were part of Profit as well. You joined our team and were working alongside us. 
Um, I suppose now when you look back, because we've all had a bit of time to reflect and obviously we're all changing what we're doing a little bit and stuff like that. What would you say is sort of the biggest things you took out of that chapter of being a PT? Because obviously what you're doing now is fairly different. Yeah. Um, and I imagine there's been some things that you've brought with you and other things that you haven't. But what for you were the, were the biggest bits along the way that, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, <laughs> anything that you, you learned along the way? So in terms of the crossover and what translates from being a personal trainer to being a pro wrestling coach, um, because I did, I took sessions beforehand now and again, like I was a fairly experienced wrestler, like within our circle of people, which meant that I would, I would take a session if the trainers weren't available. So for me on that front, from doing it to then going into PT in full time, to then coming back to doing it, um, while I'm, as, I'm while I'm doing a different thing in terms of telling people or teaching people how to be a pro wrestler compared to um, teaching people how to use the gym and how to get the most out of the gym, the underlying principles still very much sit the same in terms of structure, progression, uh, time management is a huge one. Um, understanding what's too much, what's too little. My cardio classes, my cardio and conditioning classes, while it's all ring based, so you know I'm not doing like sets of box jumps but I am doing 30 seconds of set goals the principles of programming still very much the same like as we will know as PTs and people that listen to this who are PTs or have PTs will see like exercise listers as like A, B, C or like one, two in that sense I still very much do that which allows me to manage my time so for me that is the biggest crossover the next one to that is empathy and understanding of people um for and it's the same thing with the pt industry with the fitness industry we are very much like a, a leisure activity like it is not a primary for people this is something that people come to us because they want to invest time and money in themselves but in the grand scheme of things when it comes to life and paying for stuff we are not high on the totem pole that is like paying for your house paying for food, paying for, and then we come down in like fitness and, and pro wrestling. So to have empathy for where people are at at the moment, um, to understand what makes them tick, what they enjoy out of the session means that they get more from it. They feel like I care about them because I do care about them. We have like a great little family and a community of people. Um, and then they keep coming back to us, which means that then I can help them go even further in it. And I wouldn't have got that from, not having time in a PT industry and not understanding that people operate in different ways. Yep. Yep. And one of the crossovers I was wondering about, as I thought about today's conversation is that you and I both know that when people come and see a personal trainer, they'll often come with like an initial goal, won't they? That's that surface level. I want to do this, but then we know that deeper down, there are other things that generally come out and stuff like that. I'm wondering, do you get the same thing in wrestling? Do people come for, come for a reason, but then there's a lot of other stuff going on. I mean, I don't know how much how much of that comes out in the work that you do, but I, I was just wondering as like an interesting crossover, whether that was something that was apparent or not. Yeah, to an extent. So whereas in the PT industry, we'll usually find that people go, and we've all had this experience of like, oh, I want to lose weight or I want to gain a bit of muscle, but the deeper underlying um, reasons for that sit far more than just a cosmetic reason of wanting to have a six pack. Like there, there is something that sits deeper inside of us. Now for wrestling, I sort of get two lines out of it. I get people that for them uh, across the board, people come down because they enjoy wrestling and they want to give it a go. Now where their end goal might be differs from people. I've got people that want to make this a full time living. And then I've got people that just enjoy coming down, having a wrestle around, getting to get into a ring, and then they live their life completely detached from pro wrestling. Yeah. Um, for me, it's managing the expectations of both of those parties and everybody that sits in between to still give them the most out of the session, even though person A and person B have totally different end games out of it. So not in the sense that people come and there's a deeper underlying thing out of it, but in the sense of, everybody's aiming for different paths i still need to provide a session like a group training session that helps everybody but then doesn't neglect the fact that people are going different places and then something that i'm very evident about when i first start or when i first when someone first comes in 
is asking them, what do you want out of pro wrestling? Do you want to make it a full-time living? Do you want to go to America? Do you just enjoy the fitness side out of it? I've got a good number of people now that come down to us because they enjoy the fitness and they enjoy the community that we've got. Awesome. No problems at all. They don't want to go any further than where we're at. That doesn't mean I have to stop with them. I make sure that they enjoy the sessions. But then the underlying how much do I push and how much do I go, you need to be doing this, differs. I'm not going to tell someone that comes down just because they enjoy doing it, hey, we might need to trim up a little bit because it's an aesthetic business. Someone that wants to go to America, I might have to say to them, look, if you want to go there, you're going to have to put the time in outside of this. And that's not just with me. That is ju- that is in, in life and in general. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, there's a complete different level of, set of expectations involved in that yeah. in that end game, isn't there? Which is understandable. Like, yeah, if I went to say a guy that's coming down that just does it as a bit of fun and like he has his, he has a full time career and all that sort of stuff, and then I'm like, you need to trim up and get in shape and get a six pack, and he's like, what for? I come down and train here. That'd be a stupid thing for me to say. So I don't need to put that pressure onto him. Now, if he went kind of like to lose a bit of weight i can advise him on that and i can push him in the right direction but there's no pressure into that however i have had people where they want to do it more and i've had to go come on you need to do a little bit more of this yeah yeah so that idea of managing expectations is is you know something that runs through both roles and isn't it as a pt yeah. and what you do because that's a big part of, of being a pt as well i think and Sometimes it's something that's not really given enough attention that in terms of managing expectations and being open and honest and stuff. And I was wondering as well, Liam, like now that you've now that you've sort of stepped away from PT and and wrestling is now the full time thing. Let's imagine in a in sort of a parallel universe. Um, which I know is we've talked about parallel universes at length before long, haven't we? Yeah, we yeah. <laughs> but let's imagine there's a parallel universe and you're back as a personal trainer. Does anything change from what you were doing before now that you've had your stint away from it? Um, yeah, to an extent, like I think time management would come into it um, in regards to previously i think i was quite loose in terms of just putting in sessions wherever and again that comes from just wanting to help as many people as possible and trying to fit people into diaries and then that ends up getting out of control and then you've got like i ended up having like big gaps in places and stuff so i think i'd be a lot more set with where i was doing stuff like now i have my classes and that's when i'm in now i go in before i'm because like i I manage the the facility that we're in, so I have to do cleaning and stuff like that. But that's always on my time where I'm like, right, I'm going in before, and then I'll do this out of it. I'm not here, there, and everywhere. I don't go in Mondays. I don't go in Fridays. Um, I'm not in on a Sunday unless we have an event on. So then with that, it's like I'm, I'm not going anywhere near it. And I think I take that back into PT and as my own time management out of it. Um, outside of that, in terms of coaching and stuff, I... I wouldn't say there's anything that I would change necessarily out of it. I think obviously the more that you coach, the more confident you get with stuff. So that's just an experience level that I think I'd go, if I was to go back into PT, my approach would be different, but that's because of life and time more than it being like um, a reason for changing. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that's something you see that as people have had more experience, they they do value that time side of it more than, more than uh, maybe you do when you're in, you know, your early twenties and you've not got much else going on, not much else to do. <laughs> and that's exactly it. Like being at a younger age, where you're like you have that time to go around. Like uh, another thing that I would probably avoid doing is early morning starts. Um, again, it was very much a case of people needed to come in before they go to work. So okay, let's get started and like, do that there. When I when we hit lockdown and I stopped getting up as early, my sleep increased, and then suddenly not in a bad way I gained a load of weight and in terms of like I probably I've probably added about roughly 10 kilo to my body weight to what I was when we were working at Total Fitness and I would credit that mostly down to being able to get like sleep in a regular basis so I would also probably look at that as like when I was younger it didn't matter as much like I can get up and go now I'd be like I probably sleep like let's make sure that i'm scheduling time to make sure that i'm getting adequate amount of sleeping 
yeah 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 big big things that change as uh, as as we <laughs> as we get a little bit older <laughs> but but yeah all all stuff that we learn about ourselves as well along, as along the way and moving moving sort of sorry matt from... can i just pause you just a second my phone has just hit like it's just instantly died on me i'm going to turn okay so we've we've just had a little chat about sort of experience as a PT and stuff like that. And one of the areas that I mentioned to you beforehand, before we sort of set up the recording and that for today was I wanted us to spend a bit of time talking about sort of the broad topic and subject of movement, because I never, I never um, kept this a secret. I always saw you as someone in the gym where I used to openly say to everyone, Liam's one of the most, like the most proficient technical personal trainers I've ever met, like his understanding of movement and how he applies it and teaches it is something that just always blew my mind. It, I, I learned a lot from you and I know a lot of our team did as well. And I always admired how you approach training people and I've applied some of that stuff to my, to my own principles as well. And I'm, you know, it's no real question as such, I'm more just a discussion point, but I'm just interested to know, like, where where did you or where do you think you got this almost this like this passion or this energy for movement and doing it properly I'm wondering how much of that came out of what you have to learn from a wrestling perspective and how much of that then carried over into general populations when you were in that PT environment um so run with that how you want mate because I've not really given you much of a question there but no, that's all right I want um, you to I, be I, a bit more, send Liam off and let him go wherever he wants. So you are right in the sense of um, wrestling has a big factor into it. So to sort of track back a little bit, I started wrestling and I was a skinny 17-year-old lad, didn't have much muscle on me. Um, genetically, like I'm not the biggest guy in the world. I played football a bit, but when it came to it, like if you look at like a rugby physique, that sits far more closely to a wrestling one. Whereas, like, I played football and I did, like, drama stuff. Like, I was not built for wrestling. So then I went into the gym. And then I was like, I don't know what I'm really doing here. So then I started looking up, like, okay, like, how do I do these exercises? And how do I make sure that I'm doing them correctly? Because for me, the important bit was being able to go back and wrestle. If I got injured in the gym then that's game over, like, and that's stupid. And, like, there were several moments in early days where I did stupid stuff. Like, I remember not being in the... One, unracking a barbell for a back squat in completely the wrong way. So rather than, like, walking back, I walked out with it. Then I lost my foot, or, like, I lost my placements. Then I dropped. So then I fell back into the rack. And, like, it was just stupid. And I was like, I can't be doing that. Because if I get hurt here, then it stops me doing everything that I want to do. Um, so it sort of developed that passion of knowing that I was doing stuff correctly and knowing that I wasn't going to hurt myself, um, which then led on to a couple of other bits. But then also a big influence of mine for training is a guy called Joe DeFranco that I talk about, or I've talked about quite a lot in, in past. He is uh, an American strength and conditioning coach that works quite closely with the WWE. Um, but a lot of his principles are how do we move safely um, and how do we get the most out of his training without getting hurt? And because he works with um, American footballers, that isn't, again, another primary thing. How do we get as strong as possible without getting hurt? So I took a lot of his principles and put it into my own work in just my general day-to-day gym-going life and then took it into a PT in world as well. Something else that I was finding when I got started was I wasn't as deep into that. And what I would notice on a regular basis is that, and this might have just been me, or it might just be that people don't talk about it, but I would program like a PT session where you see people doing circuits and and going like as hard as possible. And people would just die and like, and get hurt or like something would go. And I'm like, this is dumb. This doesn't make sense. And I'm not getting as much out of it. Now, for the general population, they can sometimes come in with the expectation of like, I'm going to get beasted here. And I needed to rewire them to go, actually, you're never going to feel like you're absolutely dead coming out of this session. But in the long run, that's going to be better for you. 
For some people that worked, for other people it didn't, and that's fine because we all have different personalities coming into it. But I was always, I was always dead cautious that I didn't want anybody to not be able to go to work because I've given them a stupid program that's like buckled the knee or hurt the shoulder or something along those lines. And then also it was a case of I wanted people to look at the people that I was training and go, damn, they've got a good squat on them. Damn, their deadlift is flawless. Like, wow, they're like pressing incredibly well or they're just moving generally well. Or like I've had people that have had like severe like mobility things where like, they then have people coming up to them like, oh, you're moving loads better. For me, that is a bigger compliment than like, wow, you've lost a lot of weight. Because when it comes down to it, across the board, we can do whatever we want with it. To lose weight, we, we eat less and we move around more. So as long as people are eating less, really that weight should be coming down. But to move better, I think is an intrinsically better feeling out of it, which, you know, I, I, I've never been that PT that's been like, oh, I'm going to make sure that you've lost loads of weight I'm much more interested in making people feel stronger and, and move better because I think that is a very helpful thing that people don't think about as much as looking better, whatever looking better means. Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of things that I'd like to pick up on there based on what you've just said. So right at the start of that, I think you you said something that I think I just want to repeat for everyone because I think it's like so ridiculously important that it's easy to forget. You talked about this idea of, you couldn't afford to go to the gym and get hurt because then it stopped you wrestling. Yeah. That, that applies to every single one of our clients, doesn't it? We can't Absolutely. afford to give people bad backs, you know, dicky knees and all this lot, or even just pummel them that hard that the doms they've got stops them from doing what they need to do. You know, if they can't pick the kids up off the floor or put them to bed safely or any, you know, because we've pummeled them, then it's no good. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to pick up on, which will sort of lead into a question, is you mentioned like having to almost rewire people's thinking around sort of moving better rather than being beasted. How how does that how does that look or how did that look? How did people generally take that? Did you find, you know, is that something people welcomed and started to started to buy into once they saw the improvements? How did that go? Yeah, so that was Again, once I'd got into it and I'd sort of learned that process and learned that, okay, right, I need to move this way with people, or at least I, I'm, I need to move in this direction because this doesn't feel right, which in itself was a process. Um, it was always me being open and honest with them about like, yeah, you're probably never going to die when you're coming out of my sessions, like, which again, for some people was like, well, that's why I come to the gym. Uh, and it's... Uh, I don't want to say like it's an old mentality, but I think the way that fitness used to be phrased, like I know like talking to my dad, like from him from a football background, it was like, if you aren't a sweaty mess by the end of it, then what have we done? Now him in his 20s, cool, great stuff. Him in his 40s, well, that's a, another end out of it. And I still talk to him to this day where he's murdered himself on a rowing machine. And then three days later, he's hobbling around the house. And I'm like, just learn just listen to me <laughs> um so that's me being open and honest with people from a from a get-go of being like look like we aren't going to go full metal into this and then being open and up for, with a programming that i'm putting together and going we're doing this because of this this and this and this should increase and and still giving them progression points but being far smarter with those progression points and highlighting when people are getting stronger when they're moving better when the form gets better so then they're not like oh wow i did this and now i'm a sweaty mess it's like oh wow, i did that and that felt loads better my range of motion's better i'm getting to a point where my pull-ups are feeling better or i'm just lifting more off of the ground um so one being open with my expectations from them and being open with what my program is going to look like and then two making sure that they still get the feeling of progression through different things like we all like understand like in terms of like progressive overload there's different areas that come in with that and i think something that gets missed out on a lot which goes back to movement stuff is form and technique getting better that is a progressive overload to be able to move for a bigger range of motion or move away better through a range of motion is progressive overload which shouldn't be missed out on and i think when people do that they go wow i'm i'm physically better than i was yeah yeah yeah, that's really important to sort of take all of that into account. And uh, 
I know a question I get asked a lot, um, Liam, that I'd be interested to ask you. I get this from people that I mentor that are newer in the industry and, you know, maybe it's the first time that they've ever come across doing movement screenings and then using that to, um, you know, assess someone and create a program off the back of that. A lot of newer PTs come to me with, with sort of the question around, I'm doing all this corrective work, I'm seeing improvements and stuff. At what point do you do you sort of say, okay, that's enough progress, we can start to move on to this, or do you never stop? Or And I just thought it'd be interesting to get your opinion on that. I know it might, might be a bit detached from what you do at the moment, but thinking back to your PT days, what, what were you looking for as like, you know, that's good enough, now we can move on? Or, you know, is there always an element of, corrective work I think that'd be really good for brand new PTs that are listening to this to hear so I I wouldn't say that corrective work as a, a notion I think falls under the line of strength yep and strength above all is the key to it whether we are doing a bodyweight box squat or a dumbbell goblet squat or a um, a barbell back squat the movement pattern of a squat stays the same. And then with that, it's finding the right amount of load, whether that be talking through that. Let me start over. Um, so when it comes to strength and we look at different movement patterns, it doesn't matter whether it's sets, reps, weight, the movement pattern of a squat should stay the same. Now, if we're able to do a bodyweight box squat and that movement pattern is, a, is a correct, where knees are tracking in a good line, we're not deviating in like a, a neutral spine position, we can keep that, but we can't keep it under load, then we need to make sure that we can keep that before moving it under load because it's the risk of injury that comes with that. In the same way that for a, ba for a, a back squat, if I can move 60 kilograms on my back and I can keep a good form out of that, but I add 100 kilo and now I'm at 160, I can't move that. That's corrective work in a sense. That is overall strength. So I wouldn't necessarily see it that it ends. It's just a case of we have to give the right, the right medicine to the right person yep. to progress them. I have people that were like very comfortable under a bar. I had people that I wouldn't put under a bar regardless. Their shoulders couldn't move in that position. So then I don't put them under a bar. So it's not that I'm going, the end goal is a barbell back squat. It's just a very easy way of adding load. That doesn't mean, that doesn't necessarily say that that's the best thing for them. I actually found that through lockdown, while I was, I, I very much like strength and, and lifting weight. I actually got quite a lot out of not having a bar or not being able to load a bar up as much and working on like time under tension and like pauses and stuff like that. I was like, oh, actually, I'm moving better through this. And that was without the equipment. So it's not that it goes in like a step-by-step -step contingent. It is that it is a spectrum and you gauge where people are on it, if that answers the question. No, I think that's great because I think what that does is it gives you a way of reframing the way you look at corrective work and makes it feel a bit more... I think sometimes PT struggle to... Um, to sort of accept the work they're doing with clients because they see it as corrective. Whereas if they see it as strength, they would feel differently about it themselves, which then might help them convey that message a bit better to their clients. And in your example of like, if your end goal with everyone is going to be a barbell back squat and you've got someone that can't get in there because of the shoulder, it doesn't just mean that you should then just go away and fix someone's shoulder for the sake of doing a barbell back squat, does it necessarily? No. You know, that's, no. And I think that's what a lot of PTs try and do. They try and go, well, I need you to barbell back squat, so I have to fix your shoulder. That might not be the case. Yeah, we literally don't need to do anything in the gym in regards to specific exercises. Like, again, I love a good deadlift off the floor, but like for some people, that range of motion is too big. They can't comfortably get into position on that. Their grip is just not where that needs to be. So then I'm not going to give them a conventional barbell deadlift. Like I might use a trap bar. I might use dumbbells. That's fine. The hip hinge pattern is something that everybody needs to know because we need to be able to bend over. But the way that we load that up doesn't massively matter. I think another thing just on the corrective point, the way that I would always put corrective work 
uh, or, or like at least talk about corrective work to clients and to people that I was working with was not that I need you to be better at this. It's for me to see where they were at to then program efficiently for them. So again, if they can't get their arms back and overhead into a comfortable position, there is no way that I'm putting a bar on their back. If I don't do that screen, I don't know that they're capable of that. I go to the barbell, I go get that bar on your back, and they physically can't get in position. That's already a loss for them. That's already them slightly defeated. And that's already me going, I need to make this back up again. If I realize they can't do that, so I put a dumbbell in their hands and I put them onto a box, then they can do that. Then we get progression out of that. Then they're winning. And then they stay with us because they have that feeling of positivity and moving forward and progression. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. And I know this isn't a question that I had planned for you, Liam. So I I, I apologize for putting you on the spot here with this Sorry. one. But just with you mentioned movement screening then, because again, this is something that comes up. We've talked about it a lot before with different people. For you, if you were if you were going to give a, a newer PT a little bit of advice and, and they were a bit inexperienced and, and not 100% sure what a movement screen should look like, what for you would be the key things you'd be looking for? Are the particular joints that you would be more interested in than, than others? Are there certain movements that you would definitely want to see from everyone? Like just give us a, a brief idea of, I know it's difficult to describe in a podcast because it's audio, oh, yeah, but yeah. Give, give us an idea of what, if you were a new PT that was, was you know, hadn't really done much of this before, what would you want them to be looking for from a, a bit of a movement screen if they were going to do a basic one? So when I've done when I've done movement screen, like I've done a, a wide variety of them to like nothing at all to then too much that I didn't know that information. And then it's about finding a midline for it. For me, it's about the movement patterns that we're going to prescribe to them and how they move around in those positions. So ideal, and also in terms of joints, my main focus is around hips and shoulder and the shoulder girdle. So basically, how well do we move from our hips? How well do we move from our shoulders? And then everything else sort of stems out of that. So as basic ones that I would look at is, one, I think every PT should understand what a hip hinge is and be able to coach that correctly because that is such a crucial part to making sure that people stay um, stay fit and don't get like lower back injuries. So making sure that someone can hip hinge correctly. As oftentimes at the wrestling training, where like in the warm up, like I'll put a hip hinge in, and I will go over, make sure we're moving like this, that hopefully then translates into their gym life. But making sure that we can hip hinge. Some form of squatting motion, even if it's just to a chair, to see what their range of motion is like and how comfortable they are doing that. Uh, and then in terms of shoulder positions, can they get their arms over their head? If they bring their arm up and it sits in front of the face, I'm not going to load anything up and over their head because they can't get into that naturally. Why would I then load that up? Um, and then some form of like raw motion to see how the shoulder blade works and to see where they're pulling from. Again, it's a little bit hard like to talk it through, but basically look at how they hinge, look at how they squat, look at what their press is like and look at what their pull is like. That forms the basis of strength training, which then we can program adequately for. Yeah, yeah. And then it's just as... I'm going to I'm going to use the word simple, but I suppose it's just as simple then as like you say, giving the right medicine to the right person, isn't it? And seeing yeah. where they where they sit on each continuum of those movements and prescribing accordingly. Um, yeah, pretty much. Like it's a the the notion of programming is simple to complex to simple in that really we are just prescribing sets and reps of exercises. But then the deeper philosophy behind that, the deeper understanding of that is knowing that I've prescribed the right exercise for them with the right amount of sets, with the right amount of weight, with the right range of weight, um, with a, the right amount of sets and reps that sit into that, with the right tempo. And if I'm coupling it up with stuff um, and how much they're doing over the continuum of the week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to then go back to simple again, which I show them what sets and reps they do at what exercise so like, yes, there's a deeper understanding out of it, but really when it comes down to it, I'm saying go and do a barbell back squat for this many sets and this many reps, or go and do a dumbbell box squat for this many sets and this many reps. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I think uh, a lot of listeners will have taken a lot from that, Liam, so thank you for running through that for us. Um, I want us to sort of 
go full circle now because we've we've talked about like PT stuff, movement stuff, and things like that. I'm just interested to know because I think it's it's always good to have someone on the podcast that's been a PT and then found life after personal training because it's not something that people are gonna do forever always. I mean, I know I I know I still do it. I know a lot of people that I know still do it and have done it for a long time. And I do think it's something that people can be a, a bit afraid of getting trapped in and, and not yeah. really knowing where where they're gonna go next or would they like to try something else. So I suppose where I'd like us to go to go now is sort of, you know, how how have you found moving away from PT? What are your ambitions with the wrestling stuff that you're doing? I know people would love to hear about that. There might be some people that are interested in getting involved. Just again, go at that however you want, mate, and and sort of fill us in on what that transition was like. Yeah, so the transition was a was an interesting one, um, in that like it was never it was never a decision that like I made. It wasn't like I was going right. I've got six months and then I'm going to go off and do this. Um, as we were coming out of lockdown, I was already getting set to do this co- to do the the wrestling training, and I was going to couple it up for like a couple of months of like doing a bit of PT and doing a bit of that um, to make that transition sit better. Because originally it was going to be like a day where we were just training and then the rest of my time would have been at at the gym. But then as we were coming out of lockdown, um, Total Fitness in Huddersfield suddenly went, we're closing. And I was like, oh, interesting. I guess that's me without a, a place to train. Um, it forced my hand. So then I was yeah. like, right, I've got to go into this full time now, um, which is the best thing that could have happened by far. Like, I, looking back on it, it was a silly decision for me to try and couple them up. I'd have just gone, you know what, I'm all right on this and, and just ended stuff. So it was a blessing in disguise, really. But from coming away from it, I think there's a lot of things that I've taken from personal training that I think sometimes people look at personal training, and I probably did at the same point where, I felt like there wasn't anything transferable out of it, but actually there's a load of transferable skills. It's a person to person business. It's not a gym business. And if you look at it as a person to person business, there is a lot of businesses out there that are person to person. So having empathy for people and understanding of people um, is transferable to a lot of things, which means that people can go off and, and do other things and not feel like, well, I only know how to live in shorts. I mean, I still live in shorts, um, obviously <laughs> even smaller shorts now, but that skill still applies across the board. There's a lot of business things that we all take as people that run businesses that has transferred perfectly into this. And they're, they're not entirely dissimilar, but there are there, it is a step away from personal training. Um, and again, like I know that this isn't forever and that I'll go in to do something else after this. It's just a case of enjoying my time while I'm in it to then go, what's the next step out of that? And, and being confident in it. If we're running, if the person that's listening is running a successful PT business and by successful means that they're getting by month to month, then they'll be able to do anything that they set their mind to. Yeah. Being successful doesn't mean that you're getting like 10 grand in the bank account. It means that you are running a business that operates on a month to month basis and you are staying in business. Mm. Yeah. And if you can do that whilst enjoying, like you say, like enjoying totally. what we're doing and stuff like that, it's often very underrated that, isn't it? You know, massively, massively. We are lucky. Um, in terms of, in terms of the wrestling stuff you're, you're involved with at the moment, then Liam, what, what are your ambitions with that? And as someone that's a complete and utter novice and outsider to the wrestling sport and community, what, what sort of, is, is that on any sort of growth in the UK at the moment? Is the is is it something that more people are getting involved in now? Like what what's what's the overriding feeling around the sport and, and where it's going? So twofold for me in terms of now that I'm back training, it's giving me more of an incentive to go out and wrestle. Um, my goal in terms of being a pro wrestler is to enjoy the art form as much as I can and be as expressive as possible for me to have an outlet as a a artistic form um where like for you for example like you going and playing football is an artistic expression of your passion it's the same thing that applies for me 
Um, then for the school, which is the most important bit, comes in twofold. One, I want to grow it to be as big and as successful as possible, that people look at Pursuit Pro Wrestling and go, that is the number one place in the country to learn the art form of professional wrestling. And then also the Yorkshire scene, as in like the region, has just been underdeveloped for for years um, and it's not being given the credit it deserves and we have a lot of talented people that exist in this area. For me, the Shoot Pro Wrestling is about enabling those people that were good to be even better to then be seen on not just a, a, a national scale but on a global scale as again a place that is producing great people um, in the same way that for a PT business I want the people that are looking at people that I work with to be like they're the best in this gym same thing applies. I want the wrestlers that are coming out of PPW to be the best that they can be. Uh, to answer your second question about like the, the growth of the sport, while I'd love to be like, oh, yeah, cool, it's growing, it's getting mad. Actually, it's it's not at the moment. Um, so through, we had pandemic, we came back, everybody's excited to get back into it. Fans are really excited to come back. And then that starts to wane a little bit, but just the way that the world is at the moment, we're like, petrol prices or all this sort of stuff and it's it's affecting everybody's bottom line and it's affecting everybody's like um money that's coming in and out people are less likely to go to shows at the moment because let's say i'm in leeds and there's a show that's in sheffield i might not want to make that travel because of the petrol costs out of it so that is having an effect on uh the wrestling industry as a whole which is a shame to say, but that's just the reality of it. And there's no point in me being like, oh yeah, it's great when it's not. Now, the benefit out of that is, I think that that will then create the next upset because it forces people to be creative. It forces people, it forces art to happen in a different way, which then means that we'll have growth that comes out of that. I'm trying to be as if the ground as possible and understand what's going on to make sure that the people that I'm working with go further out of it and take that opportunity to then go off and away and rebuild on what used to be there. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great that you're taking that sort of really, you know, challenging situation and then looking at, you know, bigger picture, there's going to be a life after that challenging time. So what can that look yeah. like if you do do the right things in the right way? Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's very much a case of like, it's it's being realistic with what's happening at the moment to then not let that defeat you, but to go, right, how do we move forward into it? In the same way, like with a PT business, you might have a dip. You've then got to look at what your business is to then go, how do I make this better? How do I grow and get better on the back end out of it? And for all businesses across the board. Yeah, yeah. And... That, that brings us nicely towards the end of this, Liam. I have got a question that was submitted by, because normally I have a co-host, Paul Campy, who you know. He's yeah. away on holiday at the moment. So I messaged Paul and said, have you got any questions for Liam? So he had a few, but I already had them on my list. His main question was, who was Liam's number one 90s wrestler? Because apparently Paul was massive into his wrestling in the 90s. <laughs> so he just wanted to know who your favourite wrestler was and why. So my go-to guy is The Rock. Like, for, for 90s, I started watching um, 99, 2000. So I'm just on the back end of that. Yeah. Um, but The Rock for me is, like, number one, super charismatic, just lit up the room. Um, as a kid, I would watch Sky One. So on Sky One, it used to show SmackDown and then, like, the smaller shows that, ha that show SmackDown highlights. The guy that was always on SmackDown was The Rock. Like it, it's his show, like it's his catchphrase. Um, so I was always like a rock guy from that era. As I started to get into wrestling more, my taste started to develop, and I could tell you like a number of people that like I enjoy as wrestlers that would be like whoosh, straight <laughs> over your head in the same way that like you would probably list off like a lot of like my new players, and I'd be like, great yeah, stuff. No, awesome. Like, so but for me, 90s wrestling 101 is the rock. So WrestleMania 17, which is 2001, but we'll sort of categorize it in that end. The Rock versus Stone Cold Steve Austin. I was like, Rock all the way on this. Even though like Stone Cold was like the dude, it's in his own town and all that sort of stuff. It, for me, it was always The Rock. I, I went to the gym being like, right, I need to look like The Rock. 
I don't look like the Rock. I never will look like the Rock. Um, but that was that was the end when I first started. So yeah, he's he's he was my dude, my first number one dude. Yeah, yeah. I think that that'll be a, a generational one as well. Because when I read Paul's question, I was like, it's got to be the Rock. Like from I was cool. into wrestling as well, and my brothers were, and it was like it was always the Rock. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I like there's people that sit under that. So like I was a big, and again, this probably goes over the head of like ninety nine percent of people. But Too Cool were a tag team, and there was a guy called Scotty Too Hotty. Um, and he was like, he did the worm, like yep, the dance yep. move, right? I loved him. Uh, and then recently he was in the UK. So I had to send him an email. Oh, well, I didn't have to send him an email, but I sent him an email inquiring about like a seminar, like to run it. Unfortunately, he couldn't. But I was like, this is so weird. Like I'm sat here typing like, hello, Mr. Too Hotty. Like <laughs> it was just a bizarre experience. I was like, my life is very weird. Yeah, yeah. I liked the uh, my favorite tag team were the uh, the Hardy brothers. I liked them. I oh, thought they right. were always great to watch. Very entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Lots of flips and all sorts. You know, used to yeah. rep- try and replicate those on the on your mum's couch, which you never wanted to get caught doing. But oh. yeah, yeah. To uh, um, to drop a name, I was on a, a show with Matt Hardy once, and there was uh, him and Bubba Ray Dudley there, and I was like, "This is weird. What a weird experience this is." Like, there's a load of people that. I've met through pro wrestling that I grew up watching and shared locker rooms with. And I was like, this is a, a bizarre moment that's happening around me right now. And that's just sort of like the joy of pro wrestling. But yeah, the Hardy boys, especially Jeff Hardy was a, was a cool guy to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for joining me today, Liam. It's been an absolute pleasure, not just to catch up with you, but share some of the knowledge that I knew that you had in there that, I felt people uh, should be exposed to. So it's been great to talk about PT side and the wrestling side as well. I know that off the back of this, there's people that are going to be interested in seeing what you do and finding out more. So where's the best place to to come and find you and learn more about um, Pursuit Pro Wrestling and all of that stuff? Uh, so basically it's on socials, both Facebook and Instagram. Instagram is probably the best place to catch us. So that's Pursuit Pro Wrestling um, on Instagram. Like, we are pretty big on uploading content and stuff like that, both stories and posts, um, which from a PT perspective, I probably didn't do as much of. Um, and it has been a massive benefit to us, but also it gives people a great insight into what we do. Uh, so yeah, Pursue Pro Wrestling on Instagram and on Facebook uh, is the best way to find us. We have a website um, where you can drop us a, an email. So if there are people that are like around the Sheffield area that, that want to get involved or in like a, a Yorkshire area, Drop me an email, and I'm more than happy to uh, to inquire. Like a couple of couple of weeks back, I had like a stag do that came in. So I don't know if we want to do a big <laughs> reunion and we'll get some crash mats out and we'll jump off the top rope. What a great know. idea that would yeah. be! <laughs> uh, but yeah, pursue pro wrestling on Instagram and Facebook is a place to find us. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much again, Liam. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, mate. Yeah, cheers, Mark. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome back to the Profit Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matt Robinson. Today I'm flying solo in terms of interviewing, but I do have a guest on with us. Today I'm going to be interviewing Liam Slater, who is someone that I had the pleasure of working with for a number of years um, as part of our team at Profit. Me and him were based together in the same gym in Huddersfield, and I was fortunate to be Liam's mentor. I sort of brought him into the team and sort of watched him flourish in his role as a PT. Um, And I wanted to bring Liam on because he's got an interesting story. He he was a pro wrestler turned PT, and then now he's back on the pro wrestling scene. And he's now the, uh, what, what he would call a pro wrestling coach managing the pursue pro wrestling Sheffield gym. So he's got lots of experience. He's got lots of different types of stories to share. um, And he's also an absolute, awesome coach when it comes to everything related to movement so we spend a good bit of time going through that in this interview as well so that's all for the brief introduction I'm going to let Liam take over from here as we dive into this interview we hope that you enjoy this one and as we go through these interview series I just want to ask everyone a little favor in that if you've really enjoyed a guest that's been on the show please make sure that you share a little screenshot of the episode and tag them in it on Instagram or wherever so that they can see that you've listened. I know that they always really appreciate knowing that people have enjoyed the uh, the episode. So without further ado, let's jump into our interview with Liam Slater. 